Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mike Spittle, and I'm in the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research, and it is my pleasure to introduce to you today Dr. Barbara Rothbaum. Dr. Rothbaum is a professor in psychiatry at the Emory School of Medicine in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and director of the Trauma and Anxiety Recovery Program at Emory. Dr. Rothbaum specializes in research on the treatment of individuals with anxiety disorders, particularly focusing on post-traumatic stress disorder. She has authored over 200 scientific papers and chapters, has published four books on the treatment of PTSD, and edited two others on anxiety, and received the Diplomate in Behavioral Psychology from the American Board of Professional Psychology. She is the past president of the International Society of Traumatic Stress Studies, is currently on the Scientific Advisory Board for the Anxiety Disorders Association of America, and the Obsessive Compulsive Foundation, and the Board of Directors for ADAA, and is the pioneer in the application of virtual reality to the treatment of psychological disorders. Will you please help me uh, welcome Dr. Rothbaum. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? I have been told that I am too short to stand behind the podium, <laughs> so I will stand next to it. So I want to thank, thank you for inviting me, and as many academics who owe a great debt of gratitude to NIH, NIH ask anything, and if I can do it, I will. Um, I also want to thank you. One of my patients were scheduling some things, and she knew I was going to go away and speak, and she said, don't, she's in for a fear of public speaking. She said, aren't you scared? to speak publicly. I said, no, my fear is the opposite. My fear is no one showing up. <laughs> so thank you for showing up and, and allaying that fear. So we're going to talk, oh, we're, and it's not going there. Let's see how we can make it go. Uh-oh. There we go. Um, so first, my disclosure. I'm going to talk some about uh, virtual reality. Emory um, and Georgia Tech took us and started a startup company. I'm full-time at Emory, um, but there is a company virtually better. The virtual Iraq that I'm going to talk about today, though, actually is not, was not created by virtually better, but I disclose and disclose. So most of us think of PTSD as the war veterans disease, and it is certainly a huge problem in veteran populations. But estimates are about 70% of us will undergo a traumatic event in our lifetime capable of producing PTSD. It doesn't mean that 70% of us end up with PTSD, but it does mean that trauma is ubiquitous. And the estimates are about 10% of the population in the United States at any point is suffering from PTSD. So first, let's talk a little bit about what PTSD is. I don't know if you remember in the DSM-3 and 3R, the first, PTSD is the only anxiety disorder that an external event is part of the diagnostic criteria. And so it includes the definition of the trauma. In the DSM-3 and 3R, the definition of the trauma was outside the range of usual human experience. So I know it's a varied audience. Do we have any lawyers in the audience? All right, so we're okay to trash the lawyers? <laughs> so for example, if someone went to court after a motor vehicle accident and they were also claiming PTSD, the lawyers are saying, Motor vehicle accidents aren't outside the range of usual human experience, therefore they can't have PTSD. Then, depending what statistics you look at, one in four or one in five women can expect to be the victim of some sort of sexual assault in their lifetime, and then the lawyers are saying that's not outside the range of usual human experience. So we, know, we knew we needed to get rid of that definition, and we replaced it with what I think of as the x lax definition. So if you're at least as old as I am, you might remember the old x lax commercials, regular is what's regular for you. So we tried to change it to traumatic is what's traumatic for you. And actually, that is the best predictor of who's going to get PTSD. So we could be walking down the street together and get held up 
you're sure he just wants our money, is going to leave us alone. I'm sure he's crazy on crack and is going to kill us. People would say that we'd been through the same event, but really we hadn't, because in yours, your life wasn't in danger, in mine it was. So it's always important to assess what were you scared of? What did you think could happen to you? In general, the way I see PTSD is that people are haunted by something that happened to them in their past, and the haunting nature comes out in the re-experiencing symptoms. People will think about it when they don't want to think about it, and it knocks them off kilter. Nightmares, I had one young woman who hated her nightmares so much, she would do everything she could to stay awake all night long, would finally fall asleep exhausted about 6 a.m., obviously not a good way to be real functional in the rest of her life. Flashbacks, a lot of people have heard of, for example, Vietnam veterans hearing a car backfire and hitting the ground. I also work a lot with sexual assault survivors. A lot of their flashbacks are sexually induced. And it doesn't mean the partner's done anything threatening. It can just be moving in a certain way or whispering in a certain way, and it can send them right back there. In general, people with PTSD are very avoidant. In general, they don't want to think about it. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want anything to remind them of it. Sometimes I can come across somebody, and especially actually in our, in our current veteran, population who can talk about it seemingly pretty easily and then I realize that they have cut themselves off from their emotions and it's almost like they're giving you the police blotter report or someone else's sad story and they're, they're shut down from their emotions. Psychogenic amnesia in the extreme, people don't remember what happened. One of the best first examples I saw of this um, when I was still working in Philadelphia, a rape victim remembered encountering the assailant on the stairwell. Next thing she knew, it was about 45 minutes later, she was back in her apartment, no recollection, anything bad had happened. Her first clue was when she went to the bathroom and had cuts on her thighs. It was about a month and a half later, she was able to remember what happened, and I should add an asterisk about her, because it turns out she was also the victim of childhood sexual abuse, and I think probably more prone to dissociate in the face of a new trauma, but I see it along a continuum. Sometimes people will tell me I couldn't get away, so I left my body. I was looking down on my body or outside the vehicle looking in on my body, and I really see this along the same continuum. These are all the numbing symptoms of PTSD and a big overlap with depression, but I don't think that numbing is, is just the absence of a response when we expect one. I think numbing can be a response in and of itself. Um, in a few minutes, I'll tell you about a treatment that we use a lot, exposure therapy, and sometimes in that, our guys will tell us, Doc, I'm numbing out now, and we just tell them, stay with it, and it should pass, and a lot of times they can even tell you where in their bodies they're feeling numb. A lot of hyperarousal with PTSD, a lot of sleep problems with PTSD, and a lot of reasons for sleep problems. We've mentioned nightmares. Also, PTSD is an anxiety disorder, and if you're scared, Nighttime is a really scary time. The house is quiet. Everybody's asleep. It's very easy to misinterpret those noises and think, oh my gosh, is somebody trying to get in? What do I need to do? Call 911. And they do. They play out these whole defensive maneuvers in their head. Again, not a great way to relax and get to sleep. Also, some of the people that I see that I think are function pretty well with PTSD. I think one of the ways they're doing it is they stay very busy all day long. So at night, when they're laying down and all of these distractions that have been holding these thoughts at bay are cleared away, these thoughts come flooding back to them. Difficulty concentrating. I always think of a kid. I went to Texas A&M University a few times after the bonfire collapse, and one of the students there was also an ENT responder. He said before the bonfire collapse, he had a 3.0 GPA. After the bonfire collapse, he had a 0.6 GPA. The way he described his difficulty concentrating, he said he would try to do his reading assignments, and they were just words on a page. He couldn't even put them together to make any sense out of them. Hypervigilance and exaggerated startle. I think a lot of times, even, hello, Michael. <laughs> I used, to, I used to work with Michael in, in Pennsylvania before we both went a little bit south. I went farther south. I think a lot of times, even after we successfully treat the PTSD, 
I think people are left jumpier than they were beforehand. And the way I see that is you just don't go through these types of events that lead to PTSD and walk through life as calmly as you did before. So actually this data is from Pennsylvania. If you remember, PTSD first came about as an official diagnosis in 1980 in the DSM-3. So it was really in response to the large number of Vietnam veterans with PTSD. At that point, it was, still, it was already very retrospective. It was very male. So we did a study trying to prospectively plot the course of PTSD. So we met with female rape victims and assessed their PTSD every week for 12 weeks. So we were very surprised to see in the first week following the assault, 94% of them met symptomatic, they didn't meet duration, but they met the symptomatic criteria for PTSD. So what that says to me, those symptoms we just talked about, that's the normal response to trauma. Somebody holds a knife to your throat and says, don't scream or I'll cut you, you're gonna have problems sleeping and problems concentrating and be scared to go outside by yourself, that's normal. So what we wanted to figure out is when a normal response to trauma ends and a psychopathological response that requires a diagnosis and treatment begins. So we followed them over time and we were also surprised to find three months later, 12 weeks later, almost half met the full criteria for PTSD. So what we did is we divided up the data from week 12 and went backwards. So the top line represents people who end up with chronic PTSD. The bottom line represents people who don't end up with chronic PTSD. If we want to use the term recover, we can probably use that loosely. And then it tells a little different story. Everybody starts off high. Everybody comes down a lot in the first four weeks. After that, if you look at the bottom line, the people who end up recovering they continue to improve steadily across time. Whereas if you look at the people who end up with chronic PTSD, after week four, they don't change. They don't get worse, but they don't get better. So this has led some of us to think of PTSD as a disorder of extinction. Fear and anxiety is a normal response to trauma. For most people, that fear extinguishes over time. For a significant minority, it doesn't. The good thing about that is we know a lot about extinction training. So extinction training in rodents is analogous to what we call exposure therapy in humans. So now I'll switch and talk a little bit about that. So actually, this is from, I'm going to embarrass Michael for a second, because this is based on emotional processing theory, and if everyone in this room has not read Fo and Kozak 1986, Psych Bull, when I read it, it was one of these papers that I was proud to know you guys and I wish I had written. I, I thought it made so much sense. And so the idea behind that, an emotional processing theory of PTSD, is that when something important happens to us, we need to emotionally process it. I'll use a minor example. Say on your way into work, you had a close call in a car. First person you see in the elevator, you may talk about it. Then you see the secretary at your work and you say, man, this Jeep Cherokee came out of nowhere. By the end of the day, you're not talking about it anymore. You've processed it. You've talked about it all you need to. Now blow that up about a thousand times and that's what we have with PTSD. And I think that there are various reasons that folks with PTSD haven't been able to process it. So some we call fear and anxiety. So if it makes me feel very bad to think about it or talk about it, my natural instinct is not. My natural instinct is to avoid it. But then that doesn't make it amenable to processing. Also what I call social conventions. Our society is really not very good about talking about anything negative. I mean, I, I look at the progression, you know, where people can now just talk about breast cancer and wear pink, pink ribbons and, and think how many decades it's gotten even to that point, and even still people aren't comfortable talking about that, and certainly not the types of events that lead to PTSD. And I think this is a large part of what happened to our Vietnam veterans. One of our guys told us, as his plane was taking off from Saigon, there were walking mortars following it, so he barely escapes with his life 
Less than 24 hours later, he's back in the States in his parents' living room watching what he said, and I believe him, were lies on the evening news about the war. No chance to talk about it, debrief, decompress, nothing. And it was an unpopular war, so nobody wanted to hear about that. Even though it's a cliche, I think for the World War II veterans, the long boat ride home was actually very therapeutic. They stayed together with the same folks that they served with. They spent these weeks together. They could grieve together if they had lost buddies. They could talk about it and process it. I think when they got back to the States, they were more ready to reenter society, and they reentered society as heroes. So people wanted to hear some of their stories. So for all these reasons, they don't get to process it, and so it just festers. And that's how I see that it, it haunts them. So what we think is required for good processing, activate the memory. You need to bring it up, but then you want to put it back differently. You don't want to just activate it and get people scared and get them triggered and then put it back the same way. You want them to learn something different. So there's several ways to activate the memory. We have found that imaginal exposure is very good at activating the memory. What we do is we ask people to go back in their mind's eye to the time of the traumatic event and recount it out loud in the present tense over and over and over. We tape record it and give them a tape to listen to for homework to be practicing and doing more exposure every day at home. We also do what's called in vivo exposure, in real life. So for example, exposing themselves to situations that are realistically safe, although I try not to use safe versus dangerous with PTSD folks. For example, a motor vehicle accident survivor not wanting to drive again, or drive that car, or drive through that intersection. Things that they want to be able to do, and they're just scared to since the traumatic event. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit today about in vivo, uh, Sorry, virtual reality exposure therapy. <clears throat> so for exposure, as I said, you want it to be a therapeutic exposure. You want it to change something. So an example unrelated to this, say a child gets bitten by a dog, develops a dog phobia so severe the child doesn't even want to walk out the front door for fear of encountering a dog. If you put him in a room with a dog and he runs out crying, that's an exposure, but it's not a therapeutic exposure. Nothing has changed. What you would want to do is put him in the room with the dog, maybe a cute puppy, let him stay in that room long enough to learn in here and in here that that animal poses no threat. And then maybe gradually increase the type or the kind of dog to keep that learning, to learn that animal poses no threat. I won't go through all the evidence, but there is more evidence for exposure therapy in the treatment of PTSD than any other intervention. Even we've got two FDA-approved medications for PTSD in the Institute of Medicine report from 2007, I think. Even though I have issues with that report, uh, they concluded that exposure therapy was the only one that had the strength of the evidence to say it could be recommended for PTSD. So now I'm going to go back the very first time that we tried to apply virtual reality exposure therapy to PTSD, it was with Vietnam veterans. And we figured at that point, they were already kind of a crusty group, those who were still in treatment or still had PTSD. And we thought we might need a potent stimulus and try that for them. So first, what do we mean by virtual reality? It is a multimedia interactive computer environment, but it's more than that because the user experiences a sense of presence in that environment. So I could take a picture of this room and you'd get a sense of this room. I could take a video of this room and you'd get a little bit better sense, but you wouldn't feel present in this room. If I had this room rendered in virtual reality, you would feel present in this room. And so we think that that's useful for exposure therapy. Yeah, it's easier just to show you. So people wear a head-mounted display, which is a kind of strappy helmet with two little television screens in front of each eye, earphones, and a position tracker. So just as I move my head and my view changes in reality, so it does in the virtual reality. I used to call it a cheap trick, and the computer scientists don't like it that I do that 
this raised platform. It has a bass shaker, a woofer, a speaker underneath it, so it produces vibrations. So it looks like this guy is in the virtual airplane, and we don't realize it, but a large part of the information we get in an airplane and the stimulation, we feel the engines, we feel the landing gear coming up, we feel the turbulence, and so you can feel that. In the virtual Humvee, you can feel the the vibrations from the vehicle. You can feel the vibrations from explosions or from the, the helicopter. The therapist is able to see everything on a monitor that the patient can see in the head mount display so we can comment appropriately. For some, the, the woman on the right is holding a handheld sensor or joystick. So for some environments, they will use that and they can maneuver in the virtual environment. So the, for the very first time we did it, we did the imaginal exposure to their most traumatic Vietnam memories, but with their eyes open and immersed in the virtual Vietnam. We had two scenarios. One was a virtual clearing surrounded by jungle that most of our guys referred to as a landing zone. These are early screenshots of it. And another was a virtual Huey helicopter that could fly over jungle, over rice paddies, oops, could follow a river. Um, yeah, okay. Is it going to show? This is, this is a clip of our very first patient in the virtual Vietnam in his very first class. How do you know? Longing to be 316 Delta Bravo flight at 2, 5 knots of land. We have to have an X-ray with 3 to 8. So the machine gun started back? Started now. Well, now you're not going to hear him say what he says at the end. It seems like it isn't bothering me. And I think that that's the most we can hope for. Actually, most of my patients come to me, that, what do they want? They want it to never have happened. They want to not remember it, but that's not realistic. I think the best we can hope for is it seems like it isn't bothering me. So we just did a small open clinical trial uh, with the Vietnam veterans back in the mid-90s and found statistically significant and hopefully clinically significant. Our, our colleagues, Matt Friedman and Paula Schnur at the National Center for PTSD, have an algorithm that they figured out a 10-point difference on the CAPS, the clinician-administered PTSD scale, is clinically significant. So we were glad to see that, and this is a self-report measure of PTSD. So since that time, uh, now, a number of people around the world are using virtual reality <laughs> to treat different forms of PTSD. Uh, my colleague Joanne DeFeedy has a virtual world trade center in Manhattan that they use to tra treat survivors of the 9-11 attacks. So now I'm going to shift around. I'm going to talk for the rest of the time about some translational research that we've done. Um, so, and, and you'll see how I put it all together, hopefully. <laughs> the decycloserine, um, I, have, I have the good fortune of working with some really smart and nice colleagues at Emory, Michael Davis and Carrie Ressler. And they found that decycloserine, it's an NMDA partial agonist in, in rodents, it facilitated the extinction of fear. It's actually, it's an old tuberculosis drug. It's an antibiotic. And so since it was FDA approved for humans, we could try it in humans. Um, actually, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about some of the others. So they found Mike Davis's main measure is fear potentiated startle. The Australia group um, also found that it works on freezing. And what was really cool, the Australia group found that if you administer the decycloserine right after the extinction training, that it also 
facilitates the decrease of fear and the extinction training. So the implications for us clinically, maybe you have a really good exposure therapy session and you tell your patient, here, take this. <laughs> um, because then maybe, you know, maybe it's the reconsolidation phase you know, where they're learning and where the decycloserine is really having an impact. So we used the virtual reality for this, and mainly because one of the advantages we saw of the virtual reality, a lot of times when you're doing psychotherapy research, the psychotherapy part is a little bit softer methodologically. And what we could do with the virtual reality is we could exactly control the dose of exposure therapy, and we could make sure every single patient got exactly the same exposure and the same dose, so we could control it that way. So we did it for the fear of heights because it was, it's a fairly clean disorder to start with the first test of decycloserine in humans. This doesn't do much for me. I'm not scared of heights. If you're scared of heights and you had it rendered in the, in the virtual reality, um, you, it does, they have to walk out on the catwalk and it does get people scared. So the yellow are people who received the decycloserine, blue are people who received the drug. And you can see this is the SUDS unit anxiety going up, so the higher the number on this one, the higher the anxiety, the virtual floor. So as you would expect, anybody in a height situation who's scared of heights, the higher the floor goes, the higher their anxiety goes. But you can also see this was in the first session. The drug is not sedative, anxiolytic in any way, which is what we want. The drug really seems to do nothing in and of itself. It's only to have it on board during the exposure therapy session. So what we did is we purposely underdosed the exposure therapy. We know exposure therapy is effective, so we only gave them two doses, two sessions of exposure therapy, and that meant that they only got two doses of the medication, two pills, right, one right before each session. So that was in the first session, and this was immediately post-treatment. So remember the blue are folks that got placebo. Now we're talking about change in anxiety. And the placebo folks didn't change much post-treatment, and then we knew we were underdosing the exposure therapy. We only gave them two sessions. But the folks who received the decycloserine decreased their anxiety significantly more. So this is after only two pills, two sessions. This is a week later, so not on drug. If you look at it, we brought them back in three months later. The folks who got the placebo are about the same. You know, pretty much where they came in, and the folks who got the decycloserine maintained their significant improvement. And we saw this on, on pretty much every measure that we looked at. Um, so this is, we didn't ask them to expose themselves in real life to height situations, but at the three-month follow-up, we asked them if they had, how much they had exposed themselves. The folks who got decycloserine ex reported exposing themselves to height significantly more. Their um, galvanic skin response fluctuations, so how much they're sweating, a psychophysiological response. Uh, it didn't change in the folks who got placebo, and it decreased significantly in the folks who got decycloserine. And what's also really cool is the change in this sweating psychophysiological response was related to how much they exposed themselves in heights after, at that three-month point. So this was just the, the three-month follow-up data I just showed you. And now a number of groups around the world have tested decycloserine with different groups and doing different kinds of exposure therapy. And I think the, the lines look about the same. So this is with the Boston group with social anxiety disorder. This is with the Australian group with social anxiety disorder. This is with obsessive compulsive disorder and another group with obsessive compulsive disorder. And if you notice, it doesn't make therapy better, and it wasn't proposed to, but, but a lot of times it makes therapy faster that we think is an advantage. So the current trial we're doing, and IMH funded, thank you very much, and it's ongoing now. It's with veterans, with PTSD, veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. Again, we're purposely underdosing the exposure therapy. We're using the virtual reality exposure therapy. They're getting six sessions total, and so five of virtual reality, and that means they're only getting five pills, one before each of those. So they're either getting the decycloserine 
or pill placebo or a drug with a different mechanism of action that lots of our patients are on or, or in some ways are asking for with their symptoms, alprazolam, Xanax. A lot of our patients are on, on benzos or, or want them because they express anxiety, problem sleeping. A lot of folks that do what I do with exposure therapy don't like the patients on benzos because we want people to experience their anxiety and see that it comes down and not attribute it to a pill. So a lot of people wonder who don't work with veterans, right, if this is what they saw in Iraq or Afghanistan, how is it that they get so triggered here? You know, we're clearly, or in most of our neighborhoods, most of where we work, not in war zone, not a combat zone, but you figure this is what they see here. And I think it's fairly similar up here. In Atlanta, you got to drive. We don't have a very good public transportation system. And our guys are getting triggered all the time, driving and on the interstates and in traffic jams and underpasses and overpasses and trash on the side of the road. Um, so they are really getting triggered all the time. So what we do is very similar to what I described for the virtual Vietnam. We have them go back in their mind's eye to their worst events from Iraq, describe it out loud with their eyes open, and the therapist is, is matching what they're describing. Um, we can put them, we've got a virtual Humvee and we've got a virtual city. We can put them in whatever position in the Humvee, if they were the driver or if they were the passenger. We can put them in the turret if they were the gunner. We can change the time of day. We can create smoke. We can put them in night vision goggles if that's what it was. Now this, I'm going to warn you, this is taken off of the internet, a, a clip of an actual IED. So if anyone served, it could be upsetting, and there's some bad language in it. But when I took it out before, my colleagues said I wasn't being seen. This is just a clip that I got from Skip Rizzo, who um, his group at USC developed the virtual Iraq. It's not meant to match that. We use some these clips for the psychophysiological monitoring and assessment that we do at different points. And again, this is a clip that increases in severity and throws everything at somebody. When we're using it therapeutically, we're only producing what the patient describes. So if they say driving down the road, an IED hits on the right, the place fills with smoke, that's what we'll do. We're not going to produce all of this. I also don't show blood to my patients, and we can talk about that afterwards. I'm not treating generally medics. I don't want to expose people to anything that I think is... They shouldn't be sensitive. Um, this is uh, what's well, Dr. Greg Rieger at the time. I think he was Captain Greg Rieger. He has a beta version of the virtual Iraq in Iraq giving us feedback. And so I always I like it when our guys put it on and they say, this is just what it looked like. This was just our very first guy. Um, we did, this was not on medication. Our per first patient that we were piloting through the program, the virtual Iraq, he only had four sessions and we saw a 56% decrease in his CAP score, clinician administered PTSD scale, and a similar decrease in his self-report. It's interesting, he got redeployed after, after we treated him, which is, is what people want. He was a National Guardsman. 
Um, so this is from about two or three weeks ago. So we've entered a few more folks than this now. Um, this is, again, an ongoing trial. We haven't broken the blind yet. So this is mainly a main effect of the virtual reality exposure therapy. And we, we might expect, at the end of the day, we'll see, to maybe have three different lines, maybe with the decycloserine, placebo, and alprazolam, but I don't know. But you can see that even in the six sessions, the five of the virtual reality, that people are decreasing in their PTSD symptoms. This is the clinician rated, the CAPS, and this is the PTSD symptom score, a self-report measure that they fill out at every session. So they're going in the same way. Just to show you some other people's data, um, we're working with Colonel Mike Roy, who used to be at Walter Reed, but now there's no more Walter Reed, so he's at Bethesda Naval Medical Center. He did a study using the virtual reality with active duty guys with TBI and PTSD and looking at imaging and saw changes, normalization in every single region of interest after, after the treatment, which I think is interesting. So looking at another measure, startle reactivity, that actually Michael Kozak used to do a lot, so ask him about startle afterwards, not me. So Mike, Mike, and this is a nice translational measure because Mike Davis measures startle, fear potentiated startle in the rats, and he actually built this cage. I have not wanted to try to put a person in, into a similar contraption, so this is how we measure it with, with people, with humans. We measure the eye blink response, and we can take other psychophysiological measures. Um, and this is very early data, just of, um, the first several people for which the Humvee was their primary trauma occurred in the Humvee, and you can see that their startle is decreasing over time. And just putting that together with these folks' CAP scores, you can see that their PTSD and their startle are decreasing similarly. And this is just a, a case study because we figure everybody likes to look at squiggly lines. Um, so this is just one guy. I have no idea what condition he's in, you know, which medication he got. Uh, his CAPS went from 103 at pretreatment to 68 at post-treatment. You can see that. And then I know it's going to be hard to read. So that the top red line is skin conductance. The middle is the startle, the eye blink. And the bottom is the heart rate. So that's pretreatment and that's post-treatment. And I'll go, I'll go back. So pretreatment, skin conductance, startle, and heart rate, and post-treatment. Again, you know, it's just, and we have no idea of his uh, condition, but you can see that there's some decrease responding. So now I'm going to switch and talk about early interventions, because I've been, I spent actually my entire career working on treatments and testing treatments for chronic PTSD, where I would love to go is preventing it. Now, obviously, the, the primary way to prevent it is prevent exposure to traumatic events. That's not going to happen. Life is dangerous. We're not going to prevent wars, unfortunately. But what we can do if we can figure out an early intervention, then, and that's also funded by NIMH. Thank you very much. <laughs> so again, you remember I showed you this, um, that looking at folks immediately after a traumatic event, in this case it was rape, and that we figured that it's a disorder of extinction. And so if you go back, this is theoretical, not data, that you look at the acquisition of fear and then the extinction of fear, and then testing it, it comes back. And for the early interventions, the debriefing literature is equivocal at best, and some studies have shown it can cause harm. And obviously, we don't want to cause harm. And it's really, it's very frustrating. I was president of ISTSS, the International Society for Traumatic Stress Studies, the year of the London bombings, the tsunami, and Hurricane Katrina. My brother said I was bad luck for the world. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm ready not to be president. But so it's an international trauma organization. Everybody wanted to help. There were no empirically supported treatments to deliver. I've, I've met with, with folks at the Pentagon, and they formed a little subcommittee of us to come up with recommendations for what to do in theater. We couldn't come to a consensus, because there's no data 
on an effective early intervention. And I really believe, the bottom of my heart, that there are things we can do in the immediate aftermath of trauma that can help and that can hurt. And obviously, we want to figure out what helps. And it may be different for different people. That might be part of it. So again, talking about the animal stuff, some of the properties of extinction, the, we don't think that exposure alone in extinction training erases the fear memory. And in the animal literature, they see three indices of this. So they see spontaneous recovery. It comes back with time. It returns with the delivery of shock or an aversive stimulus. They call that reinstatement and is expressed outside of the extinction context. So you put them in a different context, and they call that renewal when you see it again. The animal evidence suggests that some immediate extinction training can result in the decreases in these three indices. And, and my buddy, Mike Davis, in the animal studies, found that if you did extinction training 10 minutes after fear conditioning, in, his, in their words, I would never say this about people, they said it erased all the indices of fear that you see in reinstatement context, specificity, and spontaneous recovery. That's as opposed to how they typically do the extinction training, which is 72 hours later. And I think that this is true. I think that what's happened is they're messing with the consolidation of the fear memory before it's consolidated. And we see this in our trauma survivors. For example, our rape victims, a lot of times what happens in the emergency room or with the police immediately after the attack is part of their memory as well. And so we, what we're trying to do is see if we can change that. So remember, reinstatement is in the same context it comes back. When he did the study, found that extinction given 10 minutes after the fear conditioning prevented this relapse after stress, whereas the extinction giving 72 hours later did not. Also found it in the renewal. Again, this is different context. Found that extinction given 10 minutes after the fear conditioning prevented the return of fear in a different context, whereas the later extinction, 72 hours, did not. Found it in spontaneous recovery. So with the passage of time, found, again, extinction training given 10 minutes after the fear conditioning. You didn't see the spontaneous recovery, whereas they did when it was 72 hours later. So this led us to think that extinction training conducted very shortly after fear conditioning may prevent that consolidation of the original fear memory. So again, they do it, fear potentiated startle in rats. We can do it in adults. We did a preclinical study in humans and where we also found um, that the 10 minute in the lighter yellow, the extinction training after 10 minutes, we didn't see the spontaneous recovery. Whereas when we did the extinction training 72 hours later, we did. So what we've done is see if we can do this in immediate trauma survivors to try to prevent the development of PTSD. Long-term goal, figure whatever, pharmacological behavioral. If we figure a pharmacological agent, let's put it in the water. We put the fluoride in our water and prevent our cavities. Let's, you know, but let's figure out what will work and for whom. So what we did, and if anybody knows Atlanta and Grady Hospital, it's a large level one trauma center, inner city hospital. I told my husband, if I, if I get shot or stabbed, take me to Grady, and as soon as I'm stable, get me the heck out of there because it's a kind of scary place, but it's a wonderful place too. So what we did is people in the emergency room, once they were medically stable, if they had had a criterion A trauma, we assessed everybody in the emergency room and one month later when PTSD could be diagnosed and three months later when PTSD is chronic. Everyone's assessed at that point, but then they were randomly assigned to either just receive the assessment or re receive an early intervention. And what we did for the early intervention is a modification of prolonged imaginal exposure, like I described earlier. We did one session right there in the emergency room. Then we brought them back a week later for a second session and a week later for a third session. 
Um, I'm running short on time. We can talk about I mean, it's, it's a modification of exposure. We have them go back in their mind's eye, describe it out loud. We tape record it. We give them the tape to listen to. We talk about their thoughts and unhelpful thoughts. We help anticipate where they might want to avoid that they realistically think is an OK thing to do and, and help them try not to do that. Um, so we have now just completed that study. We assessed, I know it's hard for you to see, almost 9,000 folks. Um, so what that means is we had our staff covering the emergency room seven days a week from about 7A to 7P. Anybody that was admitted to the trauma area of the emergency room and had a trauma code, that's who went into that 9,000. So most of them were not eligible. I know, again, it's hard to see. So 6,000 of them didn't even meet the inclusion criteria. They had to meet the inclusion for a criterion A trauma. Um, so they had to have thought that maybe they could have been killed or seriously injured. It had to have been traumatic for them. Um, about another 1,200 refused to participate. Remember, this is an inner city emergency room. By the time we got people, they had already been there for hours. They were tired. Very often, if it happened in the middle of the night, they're ready to go home. So we ended up randomly assigning 137 to the intervention or assessment only. And this is just to tell you who, who they are. So about two-thirds of them were female, most of them in their average early 30s. Um, between 75 and 80 percent were African American. The traumas, roughly about a third rape about a third non-sexual assault and about a third motor vehicle. And my injury control colleagues tell me it's motor vehicle crash or motor vehicle collision, not accident. They say it's not an accident. Um, the time that we got them, the median is 6.9 hours. So over half of the people we saw within six or seven hours of the traumatic event occurring, the mean, <coughs> excuse me, the mean is 11 to 12 hours. And there are a couple of outliers <coughs> that got seen later, but most of the people we saw very early on. Our follow-up rate, 74% at four weeks and 66% at 12 weeks. Um, this is the data, and I know it's hard to follow on this, and I've got, I've got it graphically as well. What you need to keep in mind is there's no baseline of the PTSD score. I do not think it's valid to assess PTSD within six hours of a traumatic event. So what we're looking at for PTSD is basically cross-sectional from the randomized groups at one month later and three months later. Um, and it's probably easier just to see it here. So this is the PTSD symptom severity that the folks who got the intervention in blue were significantly lower at one month and at three months than the folks who did not receive the intervention. On the back depression inventory, so that we did assess at baseline. We did uh, ask them to complete a back depression inventory in the emergency room, um, and we only gave it one month later. And the folks who got the intervention were significantly lower on the back on depression. Um, it's hard to see here. The folks who did not meet the diagnosis, so you can see 74% at week 12 who got the intervention did not meet the diagnosis compared to 53%. I know some people like numbers, some people like graphs, so I get it in both. Um, so at week 12, it was significantly fewer people in, who received the intervention who met PTSD diagnostic criteria. And then we also, so this is a inner city population that's generally multiply traumatized. So when they came in, and again a month later, we asked them to complete the PTSD diagnostic scale for previous trauma, not what we called the index trauma that brought them into the emergency room, because we wanted to try to parse out prior PTSD. Um, so at baseline, they were similarly symptomatic with prior PTSD. At week four, this is not statistically significantly different, but it's, it's going in the right direction. At least we want to make sure we're not making anybody worse. And we only had, remember, three sessions of exposure therapy. In a normal course of exposure therapy, we would have time to address prior traumas, but not, not in three sessions. Obviously, what we want to be able to do with this is figure out 
who needs it for whom, and then how to transport it, for example, in theater or in mass disasters or casualties to be able to have something that people can Brent, use. what are watts? Yes. This is uh, Brain Game 600. Look. This is an October. Virtual reality and psychology are used to rewire the brain of war vet Jerry, who suffers from PTSD, short for this. Brett, what is post-traumatic stress disorder? That is it. And now the last clue. Somebody, Before... somebody sent me that clip. That was from last October. So we figure we've, we're, we're in conventional wisdom now. PTSD and virtual reality on Jeopardy. Um, and there are lots of folks in our teams to thank. This is, this is everybody's work. And I finished in time to allow a few questions or comments or disagreements. <laughs> Have I put you all to sleep? It's the afternoon, huh? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Back there. Do we need, we need the mic? Okay. I just wondered in terms of your research and, and since we, the population training is changing and a lot of, not that it, all the research was great anyway in terms of PTSD has been um, on male right. veterans and we're going to have women in different roles and I just wonder how that's informing your work or how you see that in terms of some of your future work. We also have, again, I think the ages have changed as well. So we have a different demographic in terms yeah. of our veteran population. And, I just and it's an all-volunteer force. Yes, it's, it's very different. Right. So. Um, so, and, you know, when they first sent women to Iraq and Afghanistan, they said they weren't going to be in combat and they're just in support roles. Well, what's one of the biggest roles that women are doing? Driving the trucks down the desert highways. That's where all the IEDs are hitting. I mean, women, women are getting exposed to a lot. Um, and this is going to be a slightly politically incorrect thing to say, and it's not based on data, it's based on my observation of working with a lot of female vets when we did a, a big study. Um, actually, it was Paula Schnurr's study with female veterans as a supervisor. A lot of the what we were treating was pre-military trauma. Um, so, and it, it doesn't apply to anybody. I've met a lot of female veterans who, you know, they come from military families. They are um, patriotic and want to help too, but a lot of people, it can offer them an alternative when they need to get away from something. So there's a lot of pre-military trauma that obviously predisposes someone to PTSD if exposed to another trauma. In general, women get PTSD in the general population about two to one to men. It's not true in the combat population. It's getting a lot more even in the combat population. But again, I think that it's men getting exposed to more severe traumas. I think it's um, people in the current conflict surviving injuries that they wouldn't have survived previously. Um, in general, I don't know that we really know gender differences on the response to treatment, mainly because a lot of studies just use women or just use primarily men. And when they are mixed, there's not enough data, enough power. You know, so for example, in the early sertraline studies, um, some people commented it looked like it didn't work with men, um, but they didn't have as many men in it. So it, I, I guess I'm, all of that is using a lot of words to say I don't think I can really answer your question yet. I think what we would have to do is use treatments that we know work, um, and in general, most of them work for both genders. Fascinating talk. Thank you so much. Uh, to what extent does substance abuse complicate um, these kinds of efforts at extinguishing um, uh, the traumatic memories? Um, and can we separate the two out at, at all? All right. So um, Sandra Galeo and some other epidemiologists after 9-11 in Manhattan, they followed folks and they found, as you would expect, PTSD and depression increased over time. But then if you follow them, it decreased. They also assessed substance use and it increased and it never decreased. And it was all substances. So s people started smoking cigarettes again. 
Um, we, we see that when you can look at it temporally, a lot of times, and I think Kathleen Brady at MUSC has some of this data, that it looks like the trauma occurred before the substance use disorder. So it looks like, and it sounds like when you talk to folks, that they are self-medicating. We want our sample to be as realistic as possible. A lot of people will criticize our study, say, oh, that's just the clean PTSD patients. Well, I don't even know what a clean PTSD patient is. <laughs> I'm, I'm yet to meet that person. Um, and in our veteran population, we will allow substance abuse, but not dependence. And within the abuse, we'll talk to them about some of the parameters. We, we don't want somebody using the night before a session because we don't want them coming in hungover. We don't want them using the day of a session because we want them to process and feel what they're going to feel and see that it will decrease without the substance. But if we didn't treat people who use substances excessively, we wouldn't have any PTSD patients. So we're trying to be realistic. Um, it does, I am actually in this trial more worried about marijuana use than I am in a lot of others because the cannabinoid and endocannabinoid system uh, has been shown, and partly by one of my colleagues, Carrie Ressler, um, as being important in conditioning of fear and extinction, and we don't want it to interfere with the decycloserine. So we are even a little bit more wary in, in talking to people more about not using marijuana during the study. It's only six weeks of treatment. Um, so, you know, knock on wood, we've, we've had pretty good compliance. Um, there are a few programs where they treat it together. Um, Kathleen Brady that I mentioned and Sudi Bach um, treat substance use and PTSD simultaneously have had good results. Um, Lisa Najovitz has her Seeking Safety program. Yeah. So. I think you had your hand up first, so if you okay. want to right, then I'll ask my question. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about whether there's anything to back up or maybe you have some thoughts on it. Um, about the imaginal uh, therapy or exposure therapy for trauma that has happened like child abuse and stuff mm -hmm. and the adults that you might see as a result of that because I know it's kind of a different etiology. Right. Um, so in the first study we did with Edna Foa and, and Michael was in and worked on that with rape victims um, starting in 1986. I can't remember the exact number of how long ago the average assault occurred, but I know I saw some people that it was over 20 years. And for that, there had to have been an adult assault. Um, for a number of our patients, we're treating childhood sexual abuse and incest and traumatic events that occurred 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, and I've still seen that treatment is successful. So it doesn't necessarily bode badly for treatment. What it does, and um, we're um, Doing, trying to do some reconsolidation work. And Marie Monfield, who has done one of those cool new studies um, on a reconsolidation paradigm, she's explaining a lot of how some of it works in that when there is incomplete extinction, one becomes more resistant to extinction, you know, when you talk about the reconsolidation. So I think that's the complicating factor, I think, in, in traumas that occurred a long time ago. You know, like a lot of our guys, when we tell them about the exposure therapy, they're like, what do you mean? I think about it all the time anyway. But, but I try to tell them, I think you think about it in a way that's not helpful, and we're going to try to do it differently. One of the analogies we use all the time, it's like the book opens up, you read a line, and you slam the book shut. It opens up again, you read a line, and you slam the book shut. That keeps happening, so you feel like you're thinking about it all the time, but you're not changing anything. We're going to open the book, and we're going to read the whole chapter over and over and over and over until you can make some other kind of sense out of it and put it away differently. So it, the sooner we can treat somebody, I think the better chances, because there's also so much comorbidity and that whole other sequela of stuff that happens when you have PTSD, but I'm not pessimistic about treating PTSD from a long ago prior trauma. So again, long answer. Yes. Oh, thank you for a very nice talk. My name is Paul Gaist, and it's not my direct field, so excuse me on the terminology if I'm not using the correct terminology. This may have, this may be an issue of what you're referring to about um, the phenomenon of unpacking and then repacking mm -hmm. the experience. And a lot of your talk was about possible opportunity for early intervention 
um, the fact it may actually be a window that you're trying to find mm -hmm. um, that could be essentially a therapeutic window. Um, <coughs> interestingly, from a policy perspective, um, organizations like the American Red Cross and their disaster mental health approaches have as policy being very careful to try to have centralized operations um, at, at um, in, in contact with disaster uh, victims so that they do not have to retell their story over and over again to the service provider, to the social uh, worker, uh, uh, mental health worker, et cetera, but to have to try to make it where they can tell their story once and get what they need. Your therapy, essentially with extinction therapy, you have repeated sessions. Um, with early intervention, repeated sessions over time, how do you put that together with how the American Red Cross and others are, are dealing with trying to cut down on repeated storytelling? And right. is, it, is it having to do with unpacking, but how do you repack it properly? Yeah. Um, so it's actually a complicated question and a complicated situation, and I don't have an answer based on data. Um, when I was first in Atlanta, I joined the local disaster response team, got trained in critical incident stress debriefing, mainly with the idea that I wanted to do research and then with the American Red Cross. And I soon found out it is a very kind of paramilitary organization and they really aren't encouraging of research. <laughs> um, when I went to that training, they typically do it, what that trainer did, which I think is typical and everybody does it differently in a group format and they go around the room and they make everybody talk about it. And I, I made clear, do they really, what if somebody doesn't want to talk about it? They said, no, everybody has to talk about it in that room. So I don't, I don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. I think that there probably are therapeutic elements in, in debriefing and critical incident stress debriefing. And I think we need to figure out what's right for whom. I tend to not like trauma work in groups because I think that you may be fine with yours and then you hear what happened to him and you think, oh my God, that could happen to me. And I don't think that people need to hear that um, and I think it's hard enough dealing with your own. So I'm not a fan of trauma work in groups so that might be part of it and I also think that there are individual differences. It may be the wrong dose too soon or in a different context and it typically be, it tends to be, like you said, one time. So that's why we purposely did ours over and over and over and over so that they can experience, hopefully, that extinction of the fear. You say it over and over and over and it can take some of the zing out and then they can look at it and put it away. It'll always be a bad memory, but maybe not as a fear or a PTSD memory. So I think the multiple retellings, I think, is important, but in a therapeutic context. Um, so mine, I don't know. It wasn't more than 10 years ago, but it may be hitting close to 10 years around there. And I know people uh, do it differently, and I know people have told me that's not how I do it. But so I think the multiple, I tend to think that the multiple retelling is important. Yes. Hi, right, thank you very much for the talk. Um, I was wondering what kind of studies were done to develop these treatment methods, like the virtual reality and all that, the kind of professionals that went into it. Was it just psychologists? Was it psychiatrists, biotechnologists, the types of people that came together to make that? I was wondering what the background is and also whether there's still research being done today and what types there are. Yes, 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 and yes. So, yeah, and, um, you know, what was fun about the virtual reality research is that we had psychologists and programmers all getting together and brainstorming and talking. Um, the computer scientist from Georgia Tech, Larry Hodges, brought his brilliant computer science graduate students over to my office and I explained exposure therapy, and that was for the fear of heights the first time we did it. Um, and I explained where I would take somebody in Atlanta if they had the fear of heights, and then they went back and created those in virtual reality. Um, for the one using decycloserine, that also involved um, Carrie Ressler, who's an MD, PhD uh, psychiatrist, and, and other folks. Um, we're still doing lots of research with all aspects of, of everything that you saw. Um, and a lot of times it's computer programmers working with psychologists and psychiatrists to come up with the cues. You know, for example, the computer scientists, when we first started doing something, 
um, when we did the virtual airplane, I didn't show you, you know, the computer scientist was saying, you know, we can crash this thing. It's like, no, Larry, you don't understand. We want to use this therapeutically. <laughs> so I think the, the team approach is important. Yes. Hi, my name is Anselma Chung. I'm a DRPH student at Johns Hopkins. Um, my question is, um, what's next with the virtual reality um, after you've done studies on in favor of the efficacy of virtual reality what are the some of the policy next things to do are lined up for your study um, well so obviously one of my our next steps is a study that we're doing now that I'm, I'm excited about um, and it's a three site study it's looking at so it's two by two for those of you who think that way um, it's looking, comparing virtual reality exposure therapy to prolonged imaginal exposure therapy with and without decycloserine, and also looking at genetic predictors. So, for example, we're looking at BDNF, which has um, some of the alleles have been shown to be involved in people who, and, and animals who extinguish to fear well or not, resistant to extinction. So, thinking if you have the allele where you might be more resistant to extinction, Maybe the virtual reality being a more potent stimulus, maybe that'll rescue you. Maybe the decycloserine facilitating that would rescue you. So now I, what I would like to do is try, because it's expensive, and if you don't need all the computer stuff, then don't use it. Trying to figure out who needs what kind of therapy um, and to individualize and personalize what people get. I would also like to get away from the head mount display. If we can use a flat screen or even 3D, if I can deliver it over the internet, you know, make it easier and cheaper, I would love to go that way and figure out who needs what. Great, thank you. In the trials, how long does the treatment effect last? Have you cured them or is, do they have to keep coming back? Um, so. In psychology, I don't tend to use the cure word. That's a, that's a four-letter word for, for me. Um, in general, in PTSD and with exposure therapy, we see more gains at follow-up than at post-treatment. That may be a measurement artifact because at post-treatment, if you're doing, so we're using the regular CAPS, I mean the regular DSM definition, which is four, month, uh, four weeks, one month. So that includes a lot of the time that they were in treatment, and with exposure therapy, you're stirring everything up. Is there data that are years out, like year out? They're generally still doing well. Um, it, we, we think that we're creating permanent changes in this fear structure, you know, and that, you know, as we tell our patients, you can't undo what you've done here and how you can think about it differently and how you can go there now. Um, that's not to say if they experience a new traumatic event that they won't get PTSD again. Um, but, for example, uh, we did two fear of flying studies with the virtual airplane prior to 9-11, which we were lucky because you can't even, you know, get past security now without a ticket. We followed up those folks after 9-11 to see if their fear of flying increased and, act, and we did a, a matched control for friends like them that didn't have the fear of flying. Their fear did not increase. They continued to use their coping mechanisms. Other folks who didn't have a fear of flying prior to 9-11, fear of flying increased, but, but not the patients who were treated. So in general, you know, we think we're teaching people new skills and, and new ways to deal with it, but we'll see. <laughs> now we've gone, oh yes sir, last, last question. Uh, what's the role of sleep in PTSD? And is there a relationship between dreaming and fear consolidation? So I think that the learning folks would tell you there is a lot of data that uh, memories are consolidated in sleep, and there's animal data and human data. For our early intervention study, I mean, conventional wisdom is get them before they sleep. We tried to do the study only in folks who hadn't slept yet, and the reviewers came back rightfully so, saying you don't, we don't really have the data about that, so we're going to look at that to see you know, if that influence. Um, but it is consolidated in sleep, so we like to try to get to them earlier. I also didn't show you, Mike Davis has a little bit of data that's not published yet with the decycloserine, giving it right before, at, doing the fear extinction training during the day, and, and this is, I think, in animals, and giving them the decycloserine before they sleep, and it works. Yeah, so it, I, I think that we definitely have evidence that stuff is consolidated in sleep. Um, dreams are a whole different story that I guess I should stop. <laughs> yes. Now that we have a whole cohort of people who are growing up 
around video games, not unlike what you're seeing there with the virtual reality, raises an interesting mixture question. The therapeutic thing is competing with uh, another kind of uh, thing. Yeah. Virtual. So folks that do and don't get PTSD, I think it's pretty complicated, actually. Um, and again, some of my colleagues, Kerry Ressler and his group, found a, a gene by environment interaction. Um, and he's finding out actually on a couple of genes. Um, this was FKBP5, I think. Um, and that the, with a certain allele and exposure to adversity in childhood and then exposure to a trauma as an adult that folks got PTSD or not. So it was the gene by the environment, by the exposure in childhood that predicted with exposure in adulthood if they got PTSD or not. So I think it's actually complicated. I think it is a nature-nurture thing. I also don't think when, that if you just look at the flip side of that data, and if you, you can call it resilience, but I think resilience is also more than that. I think resilience is not just the absence of PTSD. Um, Dennis Charney has done a good bit of work on resilience, um, for example, in the POWs from the Hanoi Hilton um, and in Navy SEALs. Um, and he's enumerated and other folks have some things that they think are important for resilience. And I, and I also like thinking, you know, resilience, you, uh, you have to be exposed to adversity to develop resilience, but some of the things he identified, um, a value system, humor, um, support, so I, I think I think it gets complicated. So with that, I should stop. Thank you. Thank you.